Welcome to A Look Ahead. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They're a wonderful challenge in trying to understand Scripture. In this particular series, for the months of October, November, and December of um, 2018, is entitled, Oneness in Christ. And this lesson is entitled, That They All May Be One. See if you can remember where that comes from. This is lesson number three in that series for October 20 of 2018. And as usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with us as we open your word. It's always a blessing to do that with friends and, and acquaintances so we can figure out or try to figure out better, a better understanding of these important passages. Guide and direct our discussion is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We know that a major portion of each of the Gospels is dedicated to that last week in Christ's life. It was a big event. In the case of the Gospel of John, it's like almost half. And uh, it's, of course, chapters 13. Well, really, it starts back in chapter 12 to uh, 17, really going all the way through 20. In those chapters, John focuses on what happened in the upper room and on the way to and possibly including a part of the time of what happened at, in the Garden of Gethsemane itself. We will be focusing in this lesson particularly on what, it what is sometimes designated as the Christ's, quote, high priestly prayer in John 17. Gary, you want to talk to us about that? <coughs> yes. It is a fitting designation for our Lord in this prayer consecrates himself for the sacrifice in which he is simultaneously both priest and victim. At the same time, it is a prayer of consecration on behalf of those for whom the sacrifice is offered, the disciples who were present in the upper room and those who would subsequently come to faith through their testimony. It's a quote from F.F. F. Bruce, the Gospel of John, as quoted in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay, so we know, and let's just set the outline here very quickly. He prays, prays first for himself. He uh, obviously recognizes that he's facing the most critical time, the most critical battle in the great controversy just in front of him. So he prays for himself, then immediately he prays for his disciples, his immediate disciples, and then he prays for all of us who are going to learn about the whole story and learn about the gospel from hearing from them to their writings to various others who would report on what they did. So we have those three sections we're going to be talking about. Um, two of the puzzling questions about Jesus' prayer in John 17 are, one, what was the immediate context? Where did that prayer actually take place? And look at these verses and see if you can figure out for yourself what really is going on here. In John 14, 31, it says that they had left the upper room. John 18, 1, that's several chapters later, says that he left with his disciples and went across the book Kidron. Well, now the book Brook Kidron is clear at the bottom of the valley, so that would take them a while to get there. But he left what? He left some place he was, he'd stopped, he left the upper room, it's not clear. Um, Ellen White said, before leaving the upper chamber, the Savior led his disciples in a song of praise, and that's the, the Hillel. This comes after her discussion of their future work with the Holy Spirit as presented in John 16. So it almost sounds like John 16 is happening before the end of John 14. Well, next she said, Jackie? After the hymn, they went out. Through the crowded streets, they made their way passing out of the city gate toward the Mount of Olives. The Savior had been explaining to his disciples his mission to the world and the spiritual relation to him which they were to sustain. Now he illustrates the lesson. The moon is shining bright and reveals to him a flourishing grapevine. Drawing the attention of the disciples to it, he employs it as a symbol. Can I interrupt for just a second now? So that sounds like this grapevine must have been growing outside the city gate 
before they got to the Kidron Valley. Doesn't that sound right to you mm -hmm. from what she says here? Okay, go ahead. Christ had finished the work that was given him to do. He had glorified God on the earth. He had manifested the Father's name. He had gathered out those who were to continue his work among men. Thus, in the language of one who has divine authority, Christ gives his elect church into the Father's arms. As a consecrated high priest, he intercedes for his people. As a faithful shepherd, he gathers his flock under the shadow of the Almighty in the strong and sure refuge. For him there waits the last battle with Satan, and he goes forth to meet it. Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages. Yeah, 673 and 674, that's a very interesting passage. It was interesting to me to notice that Ellen White called this prayer a high priestly prayer long before F.F. F. Bruce did. So Is, is F.F. F. Bruce uh, an Adventist theologian? No, no, he's not. I didn't think so, sure but no. <coughs> just curious. No, conservative uh, Christian, evangelical Christian. Well, we mentioned already that this, the, his prayer was divided into three parts, for himself, for his immediate disciples, and then for all the rest of us. The part the words that he says in that third part, his prayer for all of us, are amazing. And we're going we're to spend some time on that. But let's back up for a second and look at the part where he prays for himself. John 17, 1 through 5. After Jesus finished saying this, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son so that your Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all humanity, so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, um, whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. That's interesting, because many people say the only thing he really came to do was to uh, die and sacrifice his life. He says he's finished, and he hasn't gotten to the Garden of Gethsemane yet, and alone the cross. Father, give me glory in your presence now, the same glory I had with you before the world was made. Hmm. Give me glory in your presence now, as he's headed for the Garden of Gethsemane. His glory is his character, is it not? So he was yeah. doing some more teaching as to what he was like. Okay. Well, on several prior occasions, Jesus had stated that his time had not yet come. But this time was different. So, I mean, just look at a couple of those places. John 2, verse 4. You must not tell me what to do, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. And John 7, verse 30. Then they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And John 8, 20. Jesus said all this as he taught in the temple in the room where the offering boxes were placed. No one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. But now it had come. At this time, the critical time and battle and the great controversy had arrived. Contrary to Satan's claims back in the Garden of Good Eden, Jesus proved once and for all that sin leads to death. Now that was, remember Satan had said, God had said, Genesis 2.17, sin leads to death. And what did Satan say? That's a lie. That's, That's right. a lie. That's not true. <clears throat> he demonstrated the character of God under the most trying of circumstances. Thus he guaranteed the final eradication of sin and sinners, including Satan. Thus eventually restoring peace, harmony, and unity to the entire universe. That was the goal, and that's where we're headed again, right? Well, the Father and Son, and we've talked about this in, an, in several of our lessons in the past, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me, both from the Bible itself and from Ellen White's writings, that Every night, Jesus would be on his knees, maybe in the evening, maybe early in the morning, maybe both, sometimes all night long, discussing with his Father the events of the coming day. So he knew his plan was laid out before he started moving in the morning. He knew what that day was going to be like. Jesus was in full harmony with his Father's wishes, wishes at each point. Nothing happened by accident. I want to, to make that point clear. Nothing happened by accident. His death was not just a martyr's death. 
it was a planned occasion to prove the truthfulness of his statement back in the Garden of Eden that sin leads to death. Maybe we should just read that. Genesis 2, 17. Except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Okay? So, in one of the most significant verses in the entire Bible, Jim, I think you would agree with that, John 17, 3. What does it say? Eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ, whom the Father had sent. Okay, well, that's um, your version. That's a perfect, pretty good version. I think, Dennis, won't you read, yeah, you read from the, the Good News Bible? I've got the Good News translation here. And eternal life m means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. What, what are the implications of those words? What does it mean to know God? A well, parallel to that would be in uh, John 6, about verse 40 to 50, somewhere in that way. He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, mm -hmm. and I'll raise you in the last day. I think in, about, in that passage, he says that three times. Mm -hmm. And uh, in other words, incorporate everything you can about what, what Jesus had to say. Uh, and then I suggest have, if you do that, then you could be better fortified or better educated for studying the rest of the Bible. So Ellen White has some very powerful words about that. I think, Dennis, you're going to read those to us? All right. If uh, It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lessons of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Desire of Ages 83.4. Very good. Wow. What a challenge. Mm. What do you think would happen if a whole bunch of us actually took those words seriously and started doing it? Well, exactly what it says. We would um, be more in deeply imbued with his spirit. Our love will be quickened. Our confidence in him more constant or faith. Yeah. Same idea. Yeah. What? And the end would come soon. And what would that, how would that look in a church in the 21st century? if a group of people did that in one church? We would love one another as Christ loved us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would come to serve each other instead of to rule each other. So what happens to people who become better and better acquainted with Jesus? Are they, do they become attractive to others? Do people say, hmm, I'd like to be like that? Well, they become more and more like Jesus, and then they become more attractive to other yeah. people. Uh, yes, and if I didn't say that right, that's correct, yeah. Of course, it depends on whether they have ears to hear and eyes to see, sure. you know, because if they don't like Jesus, then if they hated him, they would hate us. Yeah. So we engender uh, opposition. Uh, but to those who do have ears to hear, eyes to see would, would be drawn. Okay, what about our personal experience? Does a better knowledge of Jesus make you want to know more about him? I find that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Spend more time with him. Yeah. Well, it is ba a basic premise of Christianity that Jesus came to reveal to us the truth about the Father. But eternal life will be for the purpose of getting to know God even better. That will be one of the greatest exercises and our highest of delights in the heavens above. Well, how well did Jesus actually represent the Father here on this earth? Gordon? Ellen White in letter, 80, letter number 83 from 1895 said this, Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him the history that we have of the life of Christ 
would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his, <coughs> excuse me, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. That should be a sufficient reason to believe <coughs> that uh, Jesus is just like the Father and that they communicated every night, planned for the next day. Do you think we could do that? Yes. Think God would, could guide us, could guide us or would guide us in our daily activities? If well, we, if you don't believe that you could, then you won't. Comes well, that's pretty faith. fair. <laughs> pretty comes fair statement. To, comes down to faith, you know, yeah. if you're, you're willing to seek him and keep him before your, your you know, your uh, awareness and, yeah. uh, and it becomes more uh, just closer. You become closer friends, you experience things together, uh, do things together, plan together. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. What's the difference between knowing about somebody and, and knowing them personally? Well, we could say Adam knew Eve and they had a baby. Yeah. And in Matthew 1, 25, Joseph, Joseph did not know Mary until after the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of looking at it. It becomes yeah. intimate. Uh, it becomes you incorporate it, like you said, in John 6. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Man, I don't know how much more graphic, but it's, it, it covers all the bases, seems to me. Yeah, we can, the more we experience things together, because we, we have le different levels of friendship. You know, there are people <laughs> yeah. at work that I know better than other people, but, or you may have a nodding acquaintance with somebody, or you might do certain things together, but you're not on the phone talking and mm -hmm. work, you know, doing stuff. So the people that you do things with more are the ones you, you know more. So wh what you're saying to me is that real friends are people who have a lot of shared experiences. Yes. They spend time together. They spend time together. Quality time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair, fair understanding. Well, Jesus moves next to talk about his immediate disciples. Look at John 17, starting with verse 9. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me, for they belong to you. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And by the way, this is one of the strongest reasons why people believe that, well, conservative Christians believe that the, uh, the, Revela the book of Revelation is written by John because there's some more of this, yours and mine and mine is yours. There's some of that in the book of Revelation. This, the Gospel of John is really the only place you find that. Yours is mine, mine is yours, yours is mine, mine is yours and I, I'll, I'll come in and I'll eat with you and you with me, kind of stuff. And now I am coming to you. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one just as you and I are one. Try to wrap your mind around that. We could be among ourselves as Christians as close as the Father is to the Son? While I was with them, you kept them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me. I protected them, and not one of them was lost, except the man who was bound to be lost, so that the scripture might come true. Does that remind you of something in Romans 1? <laughs> it's interesting that, you know, Paul said, I didn't baptize any of you. Oh, oh, excuse me, except for him and him. Oh, yes, and I think maybe well, I might have baptized some other people, baptized some other people too, but I don't remember for sure. I gave them your message and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I gave them your message and the world hated them. What's going on there? Well, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Okay? Keep them safe from the evil one. How many of the disciples ended up dying as martyrs? Ten. Ten of them. Out of John them. apparently was the only one 
who who managed to live long enough that he died. And why did he why did he avoid being a martyr? It was God's will. <laughs> well, yeah, he from the boiling cook. oil. He didn't cook when they threw him in a pot of boiling oil, right? Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world, and for their sake I dedicate myself to you in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. Okay? Well, in this central portion of his prayer, he prayed for his contemporary disciples in detail. We need to remember that this prayer, that wonderful piece of script that we just read, those words, followed soon after his disciples were arguing among themselves about which one of them would be the greatest. Luke 22, 24. Try to imagine that. They're arguing about who's going to be the prime minister, and Jesus is praying for them like this a few, a few maybe an hour later or something, you know. Well, first of all, he prayed that God would keep them safe while they, of necessity, remained in this world. He knew that the devil would mount an all-out campaign to destroy them or discredit them as they continued in their work of spreading the gospel. Jesus was um, fully aware of the dangers that exist in our world. He prayed for the world. He loves the world. But he knows the prince of, the world, of this world. He also knew that the spread of the gospel would be largely dependent upon the work of those followers of his, together with a few others, that would be their close associates, such as Barnabas and Paul and Silas and Timothy and some of those others we know about. Well, didn't Jesus already know that the Father would care for his disciples? I mean, isn't that sort of obvious? Doesn't God promise to care for all of us? So why, why did he need to say, Father, Father, oh, please take care of them? Wasn't that a little redundant? Evidently not. And isn't that why we pray for each other? Okay, fair enough. So yet it is true that the Father would have taken care of the disciples anyway, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this an example of persistence in prayer that Jesus encourages us to do? Mm -hmm. He says, pray for it and pray for it and pray for it. Well, maybe. Unfortunately, when this prayer took place, Jesus, Judas had already left the Twelve. He had found the attractions of this world too great a temptation to, to the point where he was willing to sell his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. What can you buy? What could you buy for 30 pieces of silver? A lot of land, wasn't it? Well, they, that's what they ultimately bought with it. It was a standard, a standard for price for a, for a good slave. A standard price for a good slave. 30, 30 pieces of silver. You, you, the, these pieces of silver, it was what you would, you would earn for a day's work. A, a good hard day's work of an ordinary labor would be a piece of silver. So a month's wage, he sold Jesus for a month's wage. Or a little over a month, maybe, because we have some, we do get a few rest days. Okay, Jim? At the Passover supper, Jesus proved his divinity by revealing <coughs> the traitor's purpose. He tenderly con included Jesus, excuse me, he tenderly included Judas in the ministry of his disciples, but the last appeal of love was unheeded. From Desire of Ages, page 720. As Jesus continued to pray for his disciples and later for us, he prayed for some incredible things that they may be one as we are. I stopped on that as I was reading through. We cannot even imagine that kind of unity on a human scale. Remember that our overall theme for this quarter is what? Unity. 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 Oneness. Oneness in Christ. And w look, at, look at this. Jesus say, we're not, you know, we, if, we, if we saw a church where people were cooperating together, they had potlucks together, they worked together to evangelize, etc., we think, man, that, we would say, that's, that's lovely, that's, that's real unity. But this? Is this even possible on a human scale? Well, well, if he prayed for it, then he believed that it <laughs> okay. was possible. Okay, if Jesus prayed for it, it's possible. Well, it can only happen through the miraculous healing grace of divinity, for sure. But it is an indispensable prerequisite for accomplishing what needs to be done. 
And what else, what also did he mean by saying, not of the world? I mean, weren't they human beings? Weren't they living here on planet Earth? Well, John in his letters said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm think, I'm thinking he's thinking the same thing there, that uh, it's, it's the world, the, the things that draw us, uh, in the, the things in the world that draw us away from God. Okay. Does one need to be not of this world in order to die a martyr's death for the cause of God? It would help, I would think, huh? You have to be consecrated in what you're doing. Remember that, it, as far as we know, all but one of the disciples, John, ended up dying a martyr's death. And if you happen to have the privilege of traveling around visiting some of the biblical sites in the country of Turkey today, I was able, uh, uh, last two, three years ago, was able to visit the, the, the spot where, where Thomas was buried. I visited the spot where, where John was, was buried after he died. And um, maybe the spots of some others. We're not so sure about the others. Okay. John 17, 20 through 26. Jim, I think you're going to help us with that. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I Let's gave stop there for a second. Sure. I want you to think about that. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. How are those things connected? Well, if they had to represent the character of Christ, then it's different than the rest of the world. Yeah. That's one way of looking that would, at it. That would, that would demonstrate that we're not of this world. Mm -hmm. well, is that a proof that God sent the, the Son? Well, if we're more evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we're following Christ, uh, and he said that the Father had sent him. You no, know, it's sort of shore up the the idea that okay. what Christ, everything Christ said was true. Um, that something was different about our relationship uh, to people around us because <coughs> we've uh, followed Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim. I gave them the gl same glory you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them as you loved, as you love me. Father, you have given them to me, I sent them to be with me, excuse me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may be, see my glory, the glory you gave me. For you loved me before the world was made, Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I continue to do so, in order that the love you, may, you have for me may be in them, and that I also may be in them. Good News Bible, John 17, 20 to 26. Wow. So that's his prayer for us, right? That's his prayer for us. And except for a short time at Pentecost, uh, it really hasn't been answered. So you think when the latter rain comes, it will be answered again? I think so. Our oneness is supposed to make the world believe. How well are we doing? Not too good. Not good. You weren't supposed to say that, even if it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm afraid we're not doing too well. Is it really possible that our oneness, our, our unity, is supposed to make the world believe that God sent Jesus Christ? Did Jesus really mean that? Well, I mean, here's his prayer. I mean, was Jesus accustomed to speaking openly with his Father? Yes, for sure. He did it all the time. I don't, we don't know if this prayer took place with, with it while his disciples were with him. Probably so. Uh, we don't have any reason to know, to say for sure that it wasn't. 
Um, but he's speaking to the Father very intimately. He says, you and I and so forth, right? Well, we know that the Father and Son work so closely together that they are indistinguishable. They were willing to sacrifice themselves for us. Uh, there, we have passages that say that the Father suffered with the Son. What could we possibly do? And, and I mean, just think about it. Uh, you know, how would you feel if your very best friend was being crucified? Would you feel like, you know, you were involved? What could we possibly do to convince the world that the Father sent His Son? Well, there's some passages. I'd like to look at one or two of them very quickly. Uh, John 5, I'm sorry, Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. For the, by the blood of Christ, that would be by His sacrificial death, we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which He gave to, uh, to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already um, decided to complete by means of Christ. So they, were, they had a plan. This wasn't, like I said, it wasn't an accident. This wasn't just chance. They had a plan. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together to everything, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. So this is a long-term plan, right? Well, look at chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 7 to 10. In fact, I'm going to start with verse 9. Um, in fact, the last little bit of verse 8. Um, Yet God gave me this privilege of, talking, of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan, that's his mystery, is to be put into effect. God, who was the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden, through all the past ages in order that at the present time by means of the church. Who does that include? His followers. Us. It'd be a little bit more personal than that. It's us. Okay? Well, yeah. The saints. Yeah, the saints are right there. You go. The by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. So let, now tell me how the angels are going to learn about the Father from us. Because we're all perfect saints, right? Well, it'll show, show them how he deals with those who are in uh, a terrible situation. They're, they're helpless in a, in a way because they've been cut off uh, from the, you know, being able to behold him directly. So how does God deal with that? And they can yeah. watch that. The w we are the demonstration of how God deals with sinners. When we're done, when the earth, earth is gone, there'll be no more dealing with sinners. Before we were created, there was no dealing with sinners. We are the prime example of how God deals with people who aren't in full cooperation with Him. So, at least they would learn that much, right? Well, you got uh, Romans 1, 18 and Romans 3, sure. 25, which is an extension of that. Um, you, you don't want to just take a parcel of that. You've got to try to put a package together. Yeah. It's part of how He loves. Yeah. Lucifer was in rebellion before we on earth rebelled. Mm -hmm. so we do have to remember that. and. A third of the angels rebelled with him, and those who did not rebel with Satan had questions. Mm -hmm. right. we, we were created to answer, to help answer those questions, to help God show the answers to those questions. And yep. showing is a process of education and teaching. Yeah. And that's everything God has done from whenever he chose to create intelligent creatures, he knew he had to educate them. Well, how many people are involved in this redemption process or this bringing back process? Here's a verse, Coloss uh, two verses, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Now, I hope none of us have any questions about the full deity of Jesus Christ. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. 
God made peace through his son's blood, somehow or other by what Jesus did here on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things both on earth and in heaven. That's a state of at one Yeah. And it is not, a, not just a one <coughs> of a, a small church here on planet earth. This is the universe. We're talking about the whole, by the time the third coming is all over with, and sin and sinners are eliminated, there's going to be perfect harmony forever throughout the universe. And John 12, 32. Yeah, well. If I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto myself. Yeah. That's all intelligent creatures, not just uh, humans. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's take some other verses. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. He will show him even greater things to do than this, and you will all be amazed. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives, li gives them life in the same way the Son gives life to those he wants to. Nor does the Father himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge so that all will honor the Son in the same way as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. He says God doesn't judge anyone. And then you get yeah. to John 12. He says yeah. it's the words he has spoken that are going to be your judge. Yep. Well, it says Jesus judges, and we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You have the white throne where he, there's the sheep and the goats, yeah. too. Earlier, earlier in his time with his disciples, on that last Thursday evening, Jesus made the startling statement we read in John 13, 34 and 35. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. Now, that wasn't a new commandment, was it? Where, where did we read that first? Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19.18. He, he said that through Moses. But he goes on. Um, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that's a whole new dimension. As I have loved you, you must love one another. That's a new story completely. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Whoa, wait a minute, hold on. Does that mean that no one else in the world loves? Depends on which Greek word you use. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, hold on, we're not going to hide behind Greek words here. Um, I think um, when people are surrounded by other loving people, they may tend to act loving. But if they're separated from them, uh, that shows their character. Are they still loving, or are they they uh, they diff Are they different then? If we are Christians, and we are truly loving, following the example of Christ, will people notice? I would think so. Yeah. yeah. You should have a Bible verse for that, found in Matthew five verse sixteen. Let your light so shine before the world, what happens? They will see the good works and know. They, they will see the good works and say, you're nice people, glorify. right? Glorify, glorify your Father which is in heaven. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. How do we love to the point where people glorify God? That's the challenge. Well, this kind of unity, which would be the result of that kind of love, is demonstrated by our love for one another and cannot be invisible. It must be seen by those around us. God is leading out a people to stand in perfect unity upon the platform of eternal truth. God designs that his people should all come into the unity of the faith. The prayer of Christ just prior to his crucifixion was that his disciples might be one, even as he was one with the Father, that the world might believe that the Father had sent him. This most touching and wonderful prayer reaches down the ages even to our day. For his words were, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. How earnestly should the professed followers of Christ seek to answer this prayer in their lives. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4 by Ellen White, page 17, verses 1 and 2. Well, does that take a little uh, self-denial and self-sacrifice to make that happen? Is there any doubt See, about that? I think so. Uh, did we, we're to seek the will of the Father, to do the will of the Father. That's what Jesus came to do 
And so he, as he said in the prayer, you know, I've done your will. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas it's Satan's object to get us to do our own will. And Jesus, of course, was the perfect example of that, right? Yes. So how can we better reflect him? Remember, we're not the lights. Even though Jesus said, let your light so shine. We are reflecting light. Where does the light come from? From Jesus. Okay. Right, through the Spirit. Through the Spirit, and then we reflect that light. Kind of okay? like a prism. Mm -hmm. And then it, and it spreads out a little bit, huh? Yep. Well, in all this talk about oneness and unity, Seventh day Adventists have been guilty sometimes of thinking that he was talking only about us, Seventh day Adventists, in the end time. That's not true. Gary, what about, what did Jesus say about that in Mark 9? John said to him, Teacher, we saw a man who was driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he doesn't belong to our group. Do not try to stop him, Jesus told them, because no one who performs a miracle in my name will be able soon afterwards to say evil things about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I assure you that anyone who gives you a drink of water because you belong to me will certainly receive his reward. Can we interrupt? Can I interrupt there for a second? He says, don't stop them. You know, if someone's casting out demons in my name, that's just fine. Does that remind you of a story that happened in Ephesus some years later? <laughs> we studied about that last quarter, remember? Seven <laughs> sons of Sceva. Yeah. <laughs> but they weren't able to cast out the demons. Mm -mm. No. If they can't do it then. And what did the demon-possessed man do? Beat them up and tore their clothes off, they ran away naked. No. Okay, Gary, go ahead. There are other sheep which belong to me that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them too. They will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. That's from the Good News Bible. John 10, verse 16. Yeah, huh? yes. We must not forget that many of God's faithful followers are still members of other churches, perhaps even other religions, or even no religion at all. If, they were, if that were not so, he would not be calling them to come out of Babylon. How many times in the Bible do we find God calling people to come out of Babylon? Major times, separate times. Well, there's the three angels' message, and then there in, 18, okay, that's, in chapter 18, there's another call. Okay, we have a very distinct second angel's message uh, in Revelation 14, and then an expansion of that message in Revelation 18, don't we? And he called them to come literally out of Babylon when to return to Jerusalem uh, yep. after the captivity. Yep. What was it, three times they had the opportunity to go back? That's right. And how many went back? A handful. One or two percent, maybe. Yeah. Pretty sad. There are many ways in which we can cooperate with members and pastors from other churches in pursuit of common goals. This gives us an opportunity to get to know them and perhaps help them uh, helps them to realize that we are not some strange cult. Now, that raises some questions. Shouldn't we, say, belong to the World Council of Churches? Why don't we belong to the World Council of Churches? Because they cut up the world into different zones, and you can, you, this church can evangelize here and this one over here, and we feel that we have a message for the whole world. Okay. John 17, 3 suggests that eternal life means knowing God. How do you understand that in relationship to 1 John 2, 3 through 6? Jackie, I think you can help us with that. If we obey God's commands, then we are sure that we know Him. Those who say that they know Him, but do not obey His commands are liars, and there is no truth in them. All those who obey His word are people whose love for God has really been made perfect. This is how we can be sure that we are in union with God. Those who say that they remain in union with God should live just as Christ, Jesus Christ did. Good News Bible. Okay. So how does that fit with John 17, verse 3? 
Remember John 17, verse 3 says, If you know God, if you know the Father, and you know the Son, you will have eternal life, right? And what does 1 John say? We know him by keeping his commandments, right? Is this uh, some kind of new legalism? Well, if you've used a different translation of the word uh, command, uh, use the word uh, prescription. Okay. It's a prescription of how to live. Mm -hmm. As a boy, you, you, God cannot command a person to do anything. He can tell you what's best for you. He told you, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you're going to die. That it was not in the nature of a threat or, or a, it was just a... A forced uh, command. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. wasn't a forced command. No. You can't Obviously, because they violated it, didn't they? Right. Yeah. Many times you see that word command or commandments, that word is, uh, and I, you know the Greek better, mm -hmm. entol, 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 L-A, LA. And, and the first one of the uh, definitions is prescription. So <laughs> uh, what we call the Ten Commandments is prescription. It's a prescription and a description as opposed to, to a proscription. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting really complicated wording there. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. people understand what a prescription is. I was yeah. given a, a prescription for uh, blood pressure. I chose to toss it on the deck in the in the kitchen, and <laughs> nine months later, I had a heart attack. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, well, and I mean, <coughs> I, I I run across this fairly often. I uh, <coughs> had the privilege of being on LLBN in a live uh, um, program last night. And immediately after the program, one of the people was standing there sort of observing things, came rushing up to me and said, you saved my life. So that's a part of being a prescription. To tell people our job is to try to direct them to do what needs to be done at the right time to save people's life. There you go. How did you save his life? I got him to surgery when he needed surgery, avoid a ruptured appendix and a few other things. Wow. Yeah. Well, God does expect us to honor his commandments and obey him. And, he, he, and I would add to what Jim said, he's saying a little different words perhaps, that's the best way to live. Yeah. God, God doesn't tell us this because he's saying, you want to do this, if you don't do this, I'll zap you or something like that. He's saying, if you just want to live a happy, healthy life, this is, the, this is the way you do it. I mean, I made you and I designed you and, and this is the way you do it. And you're free to to reject it, yeah. and if you're rejected, suffer the consequences. Yeah, if you reject it, God will honor your choice and let you go. It's it's that simple. But Revelation 13 makes it clear that the time is coming when those who insist on carefully observing God's commandments will be sought out, persecuted, perhaps even killed. Some. What is incredible for those of us living in the United States is that the beast of Revelation 13: 11 through 18 is. United States. Could that really happen here? Yes. Dennis, I think you've got some words there. Yeah, this is Ellen White, Great Controversy, 442. You know what, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Let's, let's just, I think we've got time, let's read Revelation 13, 11. Maybe some of our people haven't looked at these words recently. It'll just take us a moment or two. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's horns, so that sounds like something peaceful and quiet, but it spoke like a dragon. It used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. Now, Jim, that's, that's in contradistinction forced. between what, the way God does things. Yeah. This second beast performed great miracles and made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone and it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast's name, or the number that stands for the name. This calls for wisdom. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast, because the number stands for a human name, 
is number 666. Okay. Well, everything operates on the f basis of force, uh, fascism. Uh, in fact, if you look at in Congress, they got two big fasci up against the wall where, where the uh, Speaker of the House or whatever, and behind them is fascism, if, uh, symbols of fascism, it's, uh, which is the antithesis of the way God offers it. To choose you this day. Choose you. Hey, I got a gun to your head. I'm going to blow your brains out if you make the wrong choice. That's no love there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dennis, sorry. All right, so we're back to the great controversy uh, 442 uh, and 3. Uh, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, Revelation 13, 14. Here uh, is clearly presented a form of government in which the legislative power rests with the people, a most striking evidence that the United States is the nation uh, denoted in the prophecy. But what is the image of the beast and how is it formed? The image is made by the two-horned beast and is an image to the beast. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further their, her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy, um, I missed a word somewhere there. Anyway, in order that the United States, uh, to, in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Wow, could that happen here? Yes. I, uh, I've had the privilege of visiting the city of Istanbul in Turkey, the capital, of, not the capital, but the largest city of Turkey, several times, and almost in the middle of that city, one of the major sections, the biggest tourist attraction areas, there's a monument, sticks straight up in the air. The top of it's missing, but it was, it was a monument originally established by um, Constantine. And there he had a statue of himself and with, with symbols of the church together with his Roman crown. What do you suppose that implies? I think Constantine thought, okay, now we're all going to be faithful, humble followers of Jesus Christ. Not at all. He said, we're going to use the, the, the power of the state to enforce what we believe. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, our church, is unique among major denominations. While many have joined the World Council of Churches, which in turn has divided up the world for evangelistic purposes, we have resisted that idea, feeling that we have a message for every part of the world. We don't want anybody to be left. We want everyone to hear our message. That means that we are trying, to the best of our ability, to develop a church that has unity, cooperation, and love on a worldwide basis, with all the different languages, races, and cultures involved. No one else is trying to do that, and no, no one else is doing it. Is it really possible? Well, Gordon? From the Great Controversy by Ellen White. If God's professed people would receive the light as it shines upon them from his word, they would reach that unity for which Christ prayed, that which the apostles, apostle describes, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is, he says, one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Wow. Jesus is still ready to work with us in every way possible. The Holy Spirit will cooperate with those who are earnestly seeking, earnestly trying to represent him. If God is love and we, if, if we are to be like him, that is, loving, we should recognize that love means cooperation and unity, not discord and enmity. Jesus prayed for our safety. He prayed that we might be successful in carrying the gospel to those around us. 
He knew that Satan would do everything possible to sow discord among the disciples and followers, but as we know, not all has been unity and harmony in any church, not ours either. Why would anyone want to join a church that's fighting within itself? Infighting is absolutely contrary to the idea that God is love. What image of God do, you currently, do your current relationships portray to, the, portray to the world? What prevents you from accurately portraying God's character? What could you do to more accurately reflect God's character? I'll, I'll throw those questions to you. Remember that whether we like it or not, people around us are judging our church, even Christianity, based on what they see in us. If all Seventh-day Adventist Christians were just like you, how soon would the gospel be finished? Every Christian is expected to be an ambassador for God. Do you recognize yourself as an ambassador? If not, why not? If you recognize that you are expected to be an ambassador, does that improve your behavior? If I assign you, Jackie, to be an ambassador, do you, does that say, well, you know, better sit up and behave yourself? Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In his prayer, Jesus asked that the Father give him glory. What was he really asking for and what is glory, Jim? In biblical literature, a term that expresses two general precepts, excuse me, general concepts, honor, praise, esteem, and those distinctive qualities that bring honor or excitement, admir, excuse me, excite admiration. Brilliance that emanates from or in, surrounds a radiant being or object or splendor. In the KJV, the term appears as the translation of numerous Hebrew and Greek words, though most of these occur rather infrequently. Although these various biblical words occasionally include shades of distinction not precisely delineated by the English word glory, usually the original meaning is reasonably close to the English term and the context sufficiently clear to guide one to the intended thought. Siegfried Horn, I guess that's what him, back in the SA, SDA Bible Commentary, page 23. Or yeah. Babel Dictionary, I'm Babel sorry. Babel Dictionary, yeah. yes. Well, how about it? Are we as a church representing God's glory? Think about God's glory coming down on Mount Sinai. Do we represent that in any way? And think about Jesus on the mount where he gave that wonderful sermon. That's our challenge. Our kind and loving Father, could we be like you? How can we be like you? How can we better represent you to those around us to follow the example of Jesus with such an incredible amount of grace and humility and kindness and love? Give us more of that as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.